I would like to talk about four or five separate subjects. I'll try to do it in, in relatively concisely so that we can have a time to answer questions if you have any. But first of all, Antonio was the person in our office who really started uh, looking at cybercrime as a, you know, as a separate discipline uh, in the DA's office. And unfortunately, Antonia and her husband moved to Colorado uh, within about a year that I was DA. And so we lost two great assistant DAs. But the work that she started was something that I very much uh, wanted to continue and expand upon and, and did. When I was running for DA back in 2009, one of the areas that I knew was going to be a uh, important area of competence that the Manhattan DA's office should not just be able to handle, but lead in was in cybercrime. Now, old school, uh, you know, computer crime when I was an assistant DA was actually stealing desktops uh, out of the back doors of offices. And we've come a, a thousand miles since then in terms of the complexity of, of the issues, the global nature of the issues and, and the importance of the issue. And to me, uh, I think uh, the cybersecurity challenges we have globally are, in fact, a, uh, you know, a, a, a global crisis that we are, uh, as, a, as a global community, uh, not yet in a position to really say that we are, you know, we're winning the war. Uh, in fact, I think we're uh, losing ground more than we are gaining, gaining ground, particularly in less developed countries. But in any event, when I became the DA, uh, the first thing I did and what I would just uh, throw out as a discussion point for all of you is to try to figure out how do I take what Antonio built uh, and blow it up into uh, a division of the office that would turn out to be integral to everything that we did in the office. And that was to not just expand the number of competent cyber investigators and prosecutors, but to build a lab, a, a world-class lab at the Manhattan DA's office, uh, uh, which we did after a period of about three or four years of working on it. We, we sought and got uh, substantial funding from the city of New York. We also allotted substantial forfeiture funds. And ultimately, uh, within, I'd say, three or four years, we had a several thousand foot square foot lab with world-class equipment, with a dedicated team of uh, investigators, cyber investigators, many who are ex-military. Uh, we had uh, NYPD detectives seconded to the unit. We had our own investigators. And so it became, uh, by the time we were up and running, about a 75 to 80 person unit working on, on cybercrime at the Manhattan DA's office. So my first point is, uh, every office is different. Every office has different challenges around how you get funding uh, and how you balance funding. Uh, but I will say that our ability as an office to have our own cyber lab, and, I, and I'm sure you can do this in other states in sharing resources and sharing lab, it was really critical because the NYPD is a behemoth. Uh, and the NYPD is also a very opinionated organization. And they do kind of what they want when they want. And simply put, we could not wait for NYPD to prioritize the interrogations of devices that we needed to make our cases often uh, under pressure of uh, bail considerations and grand jury presentations. And so at the end of the day, when our lab has been up and running, we did about 2,200 uh, device interrogations a year. We, uh, uh, I mean, I think as sophisticated as, as any lab and became integral for us being able to do the work that we needed to do in cases that, as I said, and you all know, almost invariably uh, have a digital element to them and became very important, not just in the prosecution of our cases, but equally important, the exonerations of individuals who may about to be arrested by the NYPD or who were arrested by the NYPD because of the digital forensics we were able to do uh, in short order. So. Uh, how you get that funding uh, is is obviously a complicated matter, but what a lab might look like uh, or how a lab might be shared between offices is something I'd be happy to talk with anyone about, uh, either staff members or technical members or, or or DAs themselves, because I you know I went through I went through all uh, all of that, and so at the end of the day, cyber became integral uh, to our posture as a law enforcement office in New York, and obviously big city. Uh, huge cyber risk, uh, huge risk for state actor uh, attacks on New York City. And so it was important that we be able to play a role, supplementing the work of the federal government, but independently 
establishing and performing our role to protect New York City. The development of the lab and the development of the staff were two of those things. Another important thing for me and what we worked on was to develop relationships with global partners, law enforcement partners. Now, New York, I think that may make good sense in one sense because New York is obviously a very global city. A lot of the uh, the uh, frauds and scams uh, are, are cross borders and are part of New York cases and London cases and Paris cases and Singapore cases. And so we built relationships with the prosecutors uh, at Europol uh, and, and investigators, Europol, Interpol, Singapore, European countries, uh, so that we would be able to try to identify where we had overlapping investigations with those offices uh, on the same subject matter or the same individuals. Now, obviously, there were grand jury issues. We had to you know, there, there were certain things that we had to be very careful about. But what I realized as I was DA or when I ran for DA is that, you know, when I thought of the defensive perimeter for New York City uh, as a young assistant DA in the 1980s, I, you know, I was looking at Manhattan and maybe the outer boroughs. But the defensive perimeter for a city like New York today is in Singapore. It's in Southeast. It's in it's in South America. It's in Europe. And so in order to uh, uh, for me, it was a, a little bit like having uh, marker buoys all over the globe uh, where we could be in touch with both understanding threats that were coming from other parts of the globe that might be coming to Manhattan, as well as to partner on investigations that crossed borders. And uh, those relationships still continue today. While I chair the Baker McKenzie, which is a large global firm, chair their global cyber practice, I'm still talking to the prosecutors around in the EU, in Singapore, at Interpol, in Europol. Uh, and those relationships were important and, and I think made a difference. Uh, finally, what I want to talk about is where I think cyber risk is moving. Um, and I mean, Antonia, there's going to be folks who talk who are, who are more knowledgeable out about the technical aspects of cybercrime. And thank God for that. Uh, and there, I'm sure we'll speak with you on, on a number of the issues, as particularly the IT folks who are going to be on. But I, you know, I think the shift in cyber uh, policy, as I've seen it over the last number of years, has been uh, away from focusing competent cyber protectiveness as just cyber security, um, but really focusing instead on cyber resiliency. And by that, I mean the expectation that there will be attacks, there will be attacks that are successful, and you cannot prevent all attacks, whether they're from insiders or nation state actors or just criminals or a combination of all three. And all of your offices uh, are obviously targets themselves because of the information uh, that you maintain. So when we're dealing with business clients at this point, it really, to me, cybersecurity is a continuum, uh, certainly in the long term world. It focuses on making sure that uh, they have gone through the steps to analyze what's the most important data they have in their organizations, how it's secured, the effectiveness they believe of those security of those security uh, elements. And uh, there's a whole sort of prevention uh, piece that is first and foremost how I think uh, cybersecurity is actually being viewed at today, viewed as today. And I think you see this in how the cyber laws that are coming out by the SEC or the New York Department of Financial Services or the California, uh, uh, the California Cyber Agency, the laws are, be, are much more prescriptive. They are, you know, they are requiring companies not just to have cybersecurity, but to have tested their cybersecurity, to have resiliency plans that were proven and vetted by outside experts. So this is, I think, it makes total sense. Uh, you assume attacks are gonna happen. You assume that they may be successful, but if you're fortunate enough to have put in place prevention measures that eliminate most of the attacks, the issue is when something happens to you, how quickly can you get back online? And for businesses, obviously that's critical. For city services, that's critical. Uh, but I look at cyber resiliency as the goal today, not simply cyber security. And cyber resiliency has obviously many elements in it. You have five One of the more left. Thanks. Uh, one of the most, uh, it, it reflecting that view, uh, in 2017, I was sitting down with the, the then uh, Chief of Intelligence of the NYPD, John Miller, 
and we had come back from a meeting of the Global Cyber Alliance, which, as Antonio said, is a it's a it's a it's a global not for profit uh, uh, for producing cyber solutions for pretty much small and, and medium sized businesses globally. And uh, someone asked the question, "Well, if New York is attacked, if its water supply is attacked, uh, the Croton has Reservoir north of the city, for example, what's if if that's attacked by in, in a cyber attack, which is certainly one of the infrastructure attacks that we've seen around the country, what's the plan for New York City?" And the answer in 2017 was there was no plan. Uh, the NYPD knew what it would do with a hurricane. It knew what it would do if a building went down, but it didn't have a plan uh, recognizing that an attack on critical infrastructure of one part of New York City was an attack on an ecosystem. And if the power goes out, then the subways can go down, the streetlights can go down, hospitals, power can go off. Obviously, they're backup generators, but an attack on a city's critical infrastructure uh, can move throughout the city system. Uh, and therefore, uh, there had to be a special kind of plan to deal with that kind of risk and the resiliency to come back from, a from an attack. So what we did, quite simply, and I, and, and, and I throw this out as a, as, as a model, not certainly the model, but a model, is the commissioner and I got on the phone and we said, we need to do something really quickly. And we need to do something that's not going to be involved with politics with the governor. We need to get something up and running in New York City now in order to manage this cyber threat that we really have no plan for. And by plan, I mean, how do we, what are we preparing for? How do we do the preventative work? And then how do we respond and attack? So we called together uh, in a conference room in lower Manhattan, looking out over the Statue of Liberty, uh, the leaders of federal, state entities, hospitals, the the critical infrastructure sectors, uh, hospitals, technology, telecommunications, finance, medicine, all, all the major uh, sectors. And we, put, we got them in a room, we explained what the problem was, is that if New York City were attacked and, and uh, we uh, were not prepared for it, um, that is, you know, there, there was no excuse for that, uh, given what we knew. So we, what we did is we created a task force uh, called the Critical Infrastructure Task Force, which was, I think, one of the first public-private partnerships focusing on uh, cyber resiliency for critical infrastructure in a city uh, in, in the United States. And we asked them to do three things. One was to train together. Uh, we went up to the IBM cyber range, all you know, 35 or 40 of us for tabletop exercises which weren't skinny tabletop exercises. They were full-on exercises put on by IBM where the attack might start in, uh, in, the, in an attack on the power grid and you would see it morph through the subways, the hospitals, the streetlights, and each of us in those various sectors that had responsibility for those, air, those critical sectors would then have to come in and monitor and manage and hopefully put things back online. So we trained together. We asked them to receive intel from us. And it was as simple, quite honestly, as having the cyber lead at NYPD Intel with a signal device on his uh, mobile phone, push out indicators of compromise that he saw in attacks from either the NYPD or from other sources that were coming into the NYPD. You have one so, minute left. So to give you an example, San Francisco 49ers uh, were maybe a year ago were shut down with a cyber attack. I can't remember the actor. In New York City, four days before the San Francisco 49ers were shut down, the NYPD had pushed out that attack, those indicators of compromise to all the sectors in New York City so they could patch their systems and prevent and be prepared for that attack. So that's number one, how we tried to stay ahead of the curve on attacks. Now, CISA, DHS, the FBI, I think are doing a much better job of pushing information. You still have to want to receive it. And once received, you still have to act on it. And finally, we built a, we built a uh, facility where in the event of a major attack, we would all come to and we would have the monitors and the ability to communicate uh, and manage the situation in real time uh, that we still have our phone lines, still have internet connections and the like. So I look at cybersecurity today uh, with a slightly broader lens than I did years ago. I look at, I look at the, in, the ability of a community, whether it's a rural town or a major city, 
the ability of a community to be cyber resilient, resilient working together. And it makes perfect sense, I think, uh, as a way to approach um, this big issue. You know, 300 years ago, there might be a fire in a village. And in those days, every person in the village would line up from the well to the burning house, passing buckets of water to put out the house that was on fire. And they did that, I think, for two reasons. First, it was the right thing to do as a neighbor. But second, they understood that if they put out the fire of their neighbor's house, their house was better protected as well. And I think that's the approach that I urged New York uh, and I urge all the time uh, that uh, communities take to look at the cyber resiliency issue, issue, not just through their lens, but through the broader lens of community risk and resiliency. Because as has been said by many others, you know, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And if one part of the critical infrastructure system is weak, then all of us who are in that same ecosystem uh, are at risk as well. And I think these, uh, the, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done and can be done in America at very low cost, as we proved in New York, uh, to, uh, to manage this. Finally, these are going to be local issues. At the end of the day, the FBI can't respond to every power grid that's knocked out or every hospital that goes offline. Ultimately, it's going to be your communities that are going to have to figure this out. The FBI isn't going to come riding over the or hill on a white horse and save you. And I think those of us in New York City in 9-11 realized that ultimately some of these major security issues are fundamentally local ones and can't be outsourced. So I, uh, 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 I'd love to chat with you if you have questions and love to take up this subject with anybody uh, down the road.